Let me turn on the lights here. What's up? Welcome to Globally Speaking. This is about us. Are you ready? <laughs> I love it. He can never know what we just talked about. <laughs> never. What, what is your plan for today, guys? Just go wild. Just go nuts. That sounds like a plan. My name is Renato Beninato. I'm the founder, CEO, and all these fancy words that you can add of Nimzi Insights. It's a market research company in um, Seattle. Uh, we have 18 people around the world. And I happen to have a very good friend of mine with whom I have worked in the past. And we do a podcast together called, called Globally Speaking Radio. Michael, why don't you introduce yourself? Who is this, who is this very good friend you mentioned? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would have been you. Oh, 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 got it, got it. So I'm Michael Stevens. Uh, I've been responsible for growth uh, for a few companies here in the localization industry. Uh, RWS Moravia currently and... Uh, yeah, this globally speaking thing, Renato and I have been doing close, just over three years. Uh, we're rolling in on 100 episodes, and we really try to be the voice of the localization industry, both from sort of a business and new technology standpoint. I can be serious. <laughs> <laughs> we're just in awe. We're just in awe. So let our guests introduce themselves. Okay, this is guest number one. My name is Alexander Drexel. I'm German. I am a conference interpreter. Uh, I work for the European Commission during the day, doing this <laughs> during the nighttime, if you will, uh, in, in my own private capacity. So not speaking on behalf of the commission, I guess I have to vigilante point podcast. that out. <laughs> exactly. The Gorilla Podcast. Um, and I'm part of a trio that's called the Troublesome Terps. And this is an interpreting podcast that we've been doing for, gosh, uh, is it three years already? Roughly. Mm -hmm. um, and we're with, going on 40 episodes, but guys, don't, this is not a competition, okay? Yeah, exactly. Um, and you've heard two other lovely voices, so I'm going to let my co-hosts introduce themselves as well. Alex, why don't you go next? Yeah, this is Alex Gandemar, the other Alex, uh, guest number two. I am also German. I'm also a conference interpreter. I do not work at the European Union, however. I do work in Munich. So I'm a freelancer. And um, I don't know. At the moment, it's Oktoberfest, so I'm quite quite uh, partial to wearing lederhosen at the moment such a cliche i feel like that's a usp <laughs> it's I certainly can... something i'm making to my psychiatrist about that but certainly <laughs> okay <laughs> i'm jonathan downey i'm a consultant conference and business interpreter and an interpreting researcher i'm the third troublesome terp and i work mostly in the uk but wherever work takes me and I'm trying to take an, uh, interpreting from being the kind of service that clients book at uh, at the last minute to being kind of strategic partners with clients when they're looking at exporting or growing their business. So trying to get in with helping them see the usefulness of interpreting while they're still imagining their export strategy. So you guys uh, are all over the place. You're in Germany. You're, where, where are you based, <laughs> Alex? The the the. the the European Union one. Are you in Brussels? Are you in Luxembourg? Where are you based? I, I am normally based in Brussels. That's correct. But I do travel quite a bit for my job. So I go to Luxembourg from time to time and uh, mostly Germany and Austria for some business trips. How did you get together to organize it, this podcast? It's basically Alex is who's to blame for all of this, for this whole mess. <laughs> The way that I remember it is I was on the ITI board with Alex Gansmeyer and we got on really well and we were the only two interpreters on the board at the time. And then um, Alex Drexel had invited me on his other podcast, Lang FM, because I got a reputation of being a bit of a troublemaker. Controversial I, is the word you're looking for. <laughs> I'm never controversial. Um, and so realising that the two Alexes actually seemed kind of on the same wavelength i sent this email with a really kind of 1970s was it hey guys greeting or something or howdy or something um and thought i don't know if these guys know each other we i should introduce them and i think from that the podcast idea just came out with the blue almost did it not alex's 
Yeah, I mean, Alex and I, we knew each other as well yeah. from Germany and the sort of interpreting bubble, if you will. And he, he had been on the other podcast as well. And then I think the three of us just had sort of online discussions about all kinds of topics. And that Jonathan at some point suggested, you know, we should turn this into a podcast because three white dudes talking to each other, that needs to be a podcast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The world has not had enough of that. Definitely yeah, exactly. not. Definitely needs another podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Today, there will be five white dudes talking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'd be interested in, in your origin story as well, actually. I am Brazilian. I have Italian and American citizenship. And I have, thanks to 23andMe, I found out that I'm 9.9% <laughs> African. So as a pure Brazilian, I'm here representing diversity. I have African blood. I have Native American, Native Brazilian broad, b- blood. Uh, <laughs> broadly speaking, yeah. I am. Uh, very uh, international in my composition, even though I have an Italian name and uh, I I represent all the other ethnicities. So <laughs> please respect. And that, that helps you sleep at night. It does. It does. It's, <laughs> it does. But interesting. So what, 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 uh, the, the, the idea that brought us to talk to you is that interpretation is this fascinating world uh, uh, Michael, you told me once that uh, uh, what what's the story? What uh, a, a translator, an interpreter? That many many of the translators I meet often are, are there because they're failed interpreters. Yeah, so there there is a little bit of a spat between translators and interpreters. I am a translator by nature. I was born in a, a family that took me, made me leave leave in in seven countries while I was growing up. And I had to learn languages, but I don't have, I tried to be an interpreter once I was asked to be, to do chuchotage or whispering. Mm. And I have a big voice, as you can notice. So all the other participants in the room were complaining that, well, who's this guy? Who this <laughs> and I realized that it was Michael Porter, the, the, the famous uh, economist from Harvard that was making a presentation in Brazil and I was interpreting for a client uh, and uh, I came out of uh, one day of interpreting. I didn't know that you should do half interpreted for eight hours straight and my brain was fried. But the, my biggest frustration was that I don't remember a single world, word of what the guy had said. And this is one of the most brilliant people in the world, doing a private session for 10 people, and I'm interpreting every word that he says. And uh, I never again tried to do it. <laughs> I stuck to yeah. paper translation. But but I think we all have these stories, right? I mean, Jed Zorinsen, you have one as well, I yeah. think. Yeah, I mean, I, I once was got less than fully truthful information from an agency and ended up doing a day and a half of shoshotage on my own for a, a conference in a, an industry. And so I get to the end, get to about three quarters of the way through the second day. So the first day was, the first half day was just an AGM. It was a nightmare for reasons that a lot of AGMs have in common. And then the second day was um, a full on conference and I was doing shushotage for the entire time. And about three quarters of the way through, my brain just stopped working. And, you know, I understood everything that people were saying, but no sounds were coming out of my mouth. And anyone who knows me will tell you that's not a normal state for me to be in. Definitely not. I couldn't speak French or English or anything. And I was just, nah. um, and that's it, that's when I realized about being ultra careful with things. And I now actually have a reputation that, you know, I wouldn't take on. I, I will be very, very clear about what's expected, what's going on, because I don't want that to happen again. Because I think it's unprofessional to be in a job and for whatever reason, being a, be in a condition where you can't deliver. Yeah, like overextending yourself personally is, is too much. And then, it, do you think that's? Uh, do you think the interpretation world is benefiting from so much remote interpretation now? There's less travel stress on people. Is is that a help, or do you, are you still finding people lose their minds? People lose their minds even more easily when they're doing remote. I find because actually, for like the travel stress oh, wow. and everything, like you can get kind of used to it. And also, it's actually like for me, a lot of the times, the travel time is my like preparation time. Yeah, exactly. And for the remote, like you burn out quicker because there's just so much more 
stuff that you need to compensate for. Like there's a lag, there's a, there's a, I don't know, bad sound quality, bad video quality. They're not in sync. I don't know. You're chatting to the technician on the other line because of something that's your kids are coming through your office door. Yeah, exactly. Dogs the are BBC you know, moment. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I drafted ITI, which is a national association here, and they have a, I think they called it a discussion paper on remote interpreting. And I had the the amazing opportunity to, to write the first draft of that. And basically, my job was to go through the research and say, what do we know about this? And from what we can tell from the research from kind of the 1990s-ish up to fairly, a couple of years ago is that it remote does some things very, very well where there's a, an element of danger, where there's, you know, you want to reduce travel because it's a two-hour job. Why would you fly someone six hours to work too? Where there's a lack of local qualified support, great. But for a lot of meetings, and I think Alex, got, both Alexes will support me in this, there are a lot of meetings where the act of being together is part of the meeting itself. So if you've got like a sales meeting or you've got a press conference or you've got um, anything where it's not just information that's being passed, there's something about the organization that they're trying to get across. Face-to-face -face interpreting does that so much better. And also I've had clients where they've booked interpreters because it looks like they're better off and doing better if they need interpreters. Um, and kind of understanding that interpreting is not just about, it's not always purely a language thing. It's sometimes a political thing. It's sometimes a, a actually, status. yeah, it's a status thing. We need these yeah. clients to, to understand that we like them enough to book interpreters. There's that going on as well, which you don't really get with remote. Yeah. And I mean, I, I don't have a lot of personal, ex actually almost no experience, personal experience with doing remote, but um, I think it's, it's uh, one factor is that it's, um, it can be used quite well to provide sort of additional services to your clients. So when, when you cannot make it or when it's really a very sort of last minute, short notice thing to be able to still provide your services. And I think on the, on the topic of travel, I think that all five of us are probably very, um, very experienced travelers, so we have our little tips and tricks, and we we travel quite a bit. So it tends to be, I mean, it's still stressful, but maybe not the traveling in itself. It's in and of itself, it's more the time being away from family or time being away from the desk or whatever. So that tends to be more stressful. Yeah, but then also with remote interpreting, you kind of have to differentiate between a few different settings. Like I know in the states, it's a huge deal for, um, you know, like at customs, for example, like at airports, there's tons of that happening. Or then even over here in Europe, like a lot of medical interpreting is happening remotely, which again are like different sets or subsets of remote interpreting. Even um, I think what we were talking about here mainly was kind of the conference space, mm -hmm. and that's very difficult at the moment. Like that's a difficult. I don't know if it's a transition, a difficult movement or development, um, whereas in other sectors, it's just been present for a very long time and kind of semi-established. Yeah, well, part, part of our job at NIMSI is to really uh, do research in this market. And we hired a dedicated analyst and interpreter to look at everything that is happening in this space. And as you say, Alex, there is uh, an element of... Uh, uh, what we call over the phone interpreting, which is essentially yes. very short uh, 911 calls, emergency calls. It's, is it 102, 112 here in Europe? Yeah. Uh, and and, and these sometimes are interactions that last um, six minutes in average. There is another uh, space, which is the healthcare environment, which uh, it's very helpful and it can be done via video or via telephone to help in a consultation with a doctor. And usually, uh, unlike uh, civilized countries in the United States, a consultation with a doctor is seldom longer than 15 minutes. So it's also a short uh, 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 interaction. Uh, actually, the, the patient spends more time with the nurse uh, that will use interpretation than with the doctor uh, himself or herself. And then there is a third element, which is the conference interpreting, which is now uh, the, the challenge, as you mentioned before, had traditionally been the reliability and the quality of the bandwidth and the, the quality of the uh, contacts that they're uh, 
the 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 quality of the sound yeah, even and exactly. the delays and, and challenges like that but that has impre- improved a lot and in the in conference settings you have a couple of technologies there is kudo which is an american solution and then you have interprefy which is a uh, a european solution that were designed specifically for the conference setting but i think that one of the things that i found most interesting in this conference interpreting setting from a remote uh, uh and and you can have fancy solutions and you can have cheap solutions but the idea is not that it's not only the interpreter that is remote because in some situations what happens today is that the delegates might be remote so you might have a conference in paris where or a board of director meeting or something like that where the the participants are in frankfurt in london in geneva in in portugal and uh, the interpreters are on site interpreting remote speakers uh, and what what these technologies are enabling is a situation that uh, uh, it doesn't matter where each of the parties is uh, because location becomes irrelevant and you will have interpreters. I had a situation in China, and I don't remember the name of the solution that they had in place. The, the company is Transen. It's, it's one of the biggest companies in China. They organized the conference, and they had remote interpreters, and they gave each one of the participants a cell phone. And you're essentially the... the, the we are... Uh, all the participants in the conference are in a room in a board of director style and the the interpreters are in the, the next building and it 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 wasn't uh amazing but it wasn't horrible either it was totally functional so i think we're going to get to some middle term where uh, all these uh, technologies and demands of convenience. It's not so much about the travel, but even the availability of uh, the right type of, uh, of interpreters. Naturally, for German, French, Italian, Spanish, uh, 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 Turkish, or whatever major language combination, you're always going to find enough interpreters to be on site and participate. But this is extremely value when you have uh, an inuktitude to... to Korean demand or Estonian to Swahili, where there's probably one person in the world that can do that. And uh, the location becomes uh, irrelevant. It's just the availability that is important. One service you didn't mention in that list, Renato, is customer service support Mm. for over-the-phone interpretation. Is that just not as prevalent as it appears? I get questions about that on a regular basis from companies who are considering it or looking for it. Is that a regular use case? Uh, in financial services, it's it's the standard. Actually, I find it. I I remember I have a friend who is a Russian uh, speaker, and she worked in a call center for Fidelity, which is a U.S. Uh, based financial services company. And uh, frequently, she would get calls from Russian speakers asking about their portfolio, their investment, how they could withdraw money, how they could uh, sell stock or something like that. And she knew they were Russian. They knew she was Russian and she couldn't speak Russian with them for compliance reasons. So she would speak in English. Uh, the, The interpreter would do the whole interpretation of the process so that it could be documented and recorded and audited and that uh, her manager could make sure that she was saying and following policy and that she was not uh, uh, giving secret tips, tips to the, <laughs> to the, there are different situations where interpretation can be done remotely. And, and uh, I think this is one of the things that really strikes me about remote interpreting and actually interpreting in general is the sheer breadth of it and I mean when you have a company like Nimsy and you're trying to get a handle on on the market are you seeing interpreting as a single 
market that you can categorize and survey it or are you or are you approaching it as several markets that just happen to be related by a need for a similar service um, yes you can look at it you can you can create as many subcategories as you want we recently published this uh, NIMSI interpretation index with the top 33 companies in, in the world and uh, it's the first attempt to really categorize and look at this space from a business perspective. Um, we here at Globally Speaking have um, uh, talked about, and we had a fantastic interview with a Brazilian interpreter, Maria Paula Bulhões Carvalho, and she was telling us about interpreting uh, uh, Tony Robbins and motivational speakers. Uh, and we even coined the term entertainment here, which is, I think is, is a, a completely different skill uh, uh, than just regular interpretation. Uh, so there, there are so many changes. And, and another area that we just started following where uh, Sara Hickey, our, our expert in interpretation, has just started the, the analysis in this space is looking at machine interpretation. And uh, uh, we dismissed it as we dismiss machine translation and things like that when we want it to go away, but the reality is that um, Sarah is a native German, German speaker, I'm a native Portuguese speaker, and we just, um, on the spot, we connected on Skype, she spoke German and I heard Portuguese with a female voice, I spoke Portuguese, she heard German with a uh, male voice, the conversation was fluid, and we had a few laughs because names and uh, some uh, uh, words that the you can say with a funny accent or something like that turn out to be misinterpreted. But uh, I was quite impressed. It was pretty good. And if you haven't tried it, I strongly recommend it. It's actually free. Uh, but it's not ready yet for prime time for professional use. So I, I, if I were an interpreter, I wouldn't feel threatened by it. But it's something that is available, that is there. And looking at interpretation as a business is, uh, it's, it's a very interesting approach. It's about, we estimated it, we, we estimate the whole industry to be around $53 billion and interpretation is about $7.6 billion uh, of that. So, a big chunk it's maybe close to 15 percent of the whole language industry is uh around interpretation well it's, fu it's funny you should mention machine interpreting because i heard from my publishers a couple of weeks ago that my book on machine interpreting is should be out by christmas um so i've just written a book looking at machine interpreting and how we respond to that but it's interesting to frame the machine interpreting discussion within the discussion of interpreting as a business and I think that's where we were wanting the theme of the, the podcast to go because a lot of interpreters are becoming aware that they need to think like businesses but it's this need to raise awareness of interpreting as a multi-billion dollar business itself um, and looking at wider market trends that as an individual interpreter you really have no way of tracking so what um where did you get the idea in NIMSI to really chase after and try to understand the interpreting market? And are there any big trends that you would say that, you know, individual interpreters need to keep their eye on? Look, the, the, uh, it's like um, part of my background is just trying to measure stuff, right? And track and see. And uh, being a consultant, a lot of people, especially investors, want to know how big is the market and when is... Uh, uh, machine translation going to take over and, and, and replace everybody in the industry. And uh, I, I like to say that if, if you look by volume alone, Google Translate translates every day more in, in, in one day than, than all human translators do in a whole year, so in all languages. So uh, from a volume perspective, Google Translator and Machine Translator the translation has already replaced uh, humans and we don't even notice and we're still talking about how are we going to build the resistance and avoid this from happening. Now, Renato, you, you found some pretty big questions out there. There were, there were some pretty major organizations that had questions about interpretation that you felt like NIMSI was able to handle, right? 
uh, investors want to know what what is the segmentation? How is the market uh, 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 structured? What are the areas that have uh, major demand? And the biggest uh, uh, mergers mer- acquisition deal that has happened in the language services industry ever was the acquisition of Language Line by Teleperformance. This was a $1.5 billion deal that happened a few years ago. And Language Line is still today the biggest interpretation company in the world. And they do mostly, most of their revenue comes from uh, over the phone interpretation. They don't do much on-site interpretation. And this is a, a $450 million company. So that's almost half a billion uh, uh, in revenue that is generated by the, ba- the the biggest player in the market. The second player uh, is a, a far second player, which would be Syracom, which is around $140 million. So you go from 450 down to 140. The third is already uh, uh, below $100 million. They are at $99 million. And this is Stratus Video and In-Demand Interpreting. And they focus on the um, video interpreting market for the healthcare industry. And then you have the first European player would be the big word in the UK, yeah, with about $60 million in in revenue. And they do the public sector. The public sector is the biggest buyer. So if I can just jump in here with a a related question, I'd I'd be especially interested in, in Michael's take actually as, a bit of an outsider, if I can put it like that, at least for for uh, interpreting, um, because I mean, you talked a, lo- a lot of about the corporate players now, which makes a lot of sense, and and that was really interesting to see the 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 NIMSI index of the interpreting market. But what's sort of your perception of of interpreting? Because the um, I guess what I'm trying to say is interpreting, at least to me, seems to consist of so many small segments and niches and there's conference and there's medical and there's over the phone i mean how do you find it difficult to sort of get a get a i think maybe that was your question as well jonathan is how difficult is it to to put these numbers on it because especially since there are so many individual players like all of the freelance conference interpreters for example because not everybody works with agencies of course Mm. and the national markets also seem to be very different at least the u.s for example is completely different from germany I, I would say from my perspective, interpretation uh, seemed like a rather deeply established traditional business that was extremely uh, protected from some of the extreme changes of direction that technology and the sort of fast moving Silicon Valley world tends to uh just kind of drive people nuts. You know, they lose their shirts in a couple of years. Interpretation seemed um, removed and kind of protected from that in many ways. Cause I, when I would think about interpretation, I would think of very traditional industries being medical finance, uh, uh, public policy, politics, that uh, all of that going on as my exposure to the industry came through the uh, interpretainment and some of the remote interpretation conversations we've had with the podcast. So at that point, I start realizing, well, everyone is affected. Uh, everyone does. We, we do follow whether we're early on the change curve or later uh, as an adopter, there are things that are happening. And as you mentioned before, it's probably even more essential for interpreters to start understanding how clients buy these services, mm-hmm. what their impressions are, um, because there, there still is a need and people will pay Renato can correct me if the data shows something different, but they will pay for good human services. Mm -hmm. But you need to be concerned if what you're doing can easily be replaced by a machine. Totally agree. If you're that type of interpreter, I would get out. (laughs) And again, that's me not knowing the industry that well, but that would be my advice. But if you're someone who continually is able to add value that the machine can't catch, that you're bringing a level of creativity and perspective in what you're doing, or even you know uh, uh, a level of uh, security that you provide your clients. That you're there on time, you're prepared, you're working hours. Like that conversation about burnout. If you have the inability to manage your the amount of work you're taking on, 
Well, machines don't have that problem. So be, be smart about what you take on and don't burn out. Do what you do at your top in your peak performance. If you're an interpreter, give your best. Yeah. yeah and the other point that I would make is that the reality uh, is that interpreters in general, and, and, and this is language professionals in general are very, very bad at business and economics, right? There is an element of supply and demand. And there is an element of uh, uh, scarcity. If you think of top-notch interpreters, uh, uh, the, the reality is that the market is, there is more demand for high-quality interpreter than there is supply. But there is. The fact is that uh, you're probably thinking of German English. Maybe there's an oversupply in German English. <laughs> Right. So and this is the problem. You look and, and this is where a company like Nimzi comes into the picture, because we hear a lot of opinion that is the the aggregate of the conversations that you have among yourselves. So you, by the nature of your uh, uh, language pair, you talk to a lot of people who are in the same space and uh, 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 it, you have the impression that there is an oversupply in the market because that's your specific niche of the market. But if you look at the industry as a whole, the industry as a whole is growing. The industry as a whole is demanding for new language pairs. It's like demanding different time zone supply. It's demanding more responsiveness. This is why this uh, um, rise of the... What, what we call a name is the VIT uh, environment, the virtual interpretation technology environment. Uh, you can call remote, you can call uh, uh, over the phone, but the reality is yeah, web-based, and there are multiple ways of delivering this virtual interpretation environment. But th what has happened is that the technology has made virtual interpretation very easy to create, and you have, we, we, in our research, we have said that uh, virtual interpretation is uh, a solution in search of a problem because there is so much supply of, of technologies. I think we have identified over 40 technologies. And there was one, a French company, I forgot the name, that just shut down uh, uh, a few weeks ago. They just, they couldn't survive with the investment. I know of a couple of Russian companies like um, uh, Interpreters on Demand or, or things like that. These are companies that they weren't able to uh, create a, a, a client base and they essentially uh, were eliminated from the market for lack of demand uh, uh, because there is an oversupply. So this is what happens with technology in general. Uh, because of the uh, uh, this, uh, I always forget the name of the standard. Is it uh, the, which is available in in uh, uh, Chrome and um, oh, uh, WebRTC, Firefox, uh, uh, WebRTC. Because of WebRTC, anybody can build a, a solution. Yes. Uh, but then you need to sell. You need to have clients. You need to have interpreters. You need to have a marketplace. And that's where things get hard, right? Uh, this is why uh, we believe that out of these 40 uh, technologies that we have identified, and there are new ones popping up every day, um, you'll probably have four or five that are going to survive in the next few years. And that they're becoming, they're going to become a little bit of a standard, right? But that's, I think, where I see the, the sort of problem or conflict, because I think at least from sort of our interpreting community's point of view, I think we would, quote unquote, prefer technology providers that are just that, te uh, technology providers. Mm -hmm. But I think from the point of view, from the corporate point of view, it makes much more sense to go into more of an agency direction and try to have interpreters and, and a directory of interpreters. So how do you see that? But, but Alex, do you really work for final clients? You don't. You 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 work for event organizers, you work for uh, uh, sound, uh, technology sound companies that provide the, the cabins and the headsets and the microphones and the video cameras and so on. These tend to be 
the companies that hire the interpreters, right? But Roberto, I think that really depends on the market because, of, for example, in Germany, and you've also pointed this out in your interpreting index in Germany, it's very different. Like in Germany, we mainly work for direct clients. Like in fact, yes. so that, that I mean, you've pointed that out in your index as well. But so here, I think it's exactly on the money what Alex was saying. The first German company is the last one. Is the third. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's also the last one we would work for, but you know. Um, no, but it's interesting because in, in Germany, it's such a different market. And you've also pointed out that Italy and France are also quite quite similar to that. Um, but yeah, I get what Alex is saying because it's difficult if you have a technology company that sells itself as that, but then kind of backtracks or like through the back door tries to present itself yeah. as an agency. But the, the you know challenge I mean? is that nobody has cornered the... the and, uh, let, let me rephrase what I was going to say. We, tr we want and we try to think about the market as a monolithic thing where all the buyers behave the same way. The reality is that it is an extremely fragmented market that touches all areas of economic activity that has multiple buyer behaviors depending on the type of situation. And so uh, it's, it's, I think that... Uh, the way that you uh, uh, address this in the interpretation community is you, you have the mode and the modality, right? Mm -hmm. The mode is is it it's how you deliver it. Is it uh, uh, like simultaneous, consecutive. Uh, yeah. simultaneous, consecutive, etc., yeah. etc. Et and the modality would be: is it over the phone? Is it live? Is it in a cabin? Is it uh, uh, um, silent or the different modalities that you can use so if you if you just go by these two uh, uh parameters you have uh, uh an incredible amount of combinations that could create different buyer behaviors so uh maybe you're you're going to work with the frankfurt Messe, this huge uh, group they, they probably have an exclusive agreement with a company that provi provides the the sound infrastructure and that company that provides the sound infrastructure because they have the microphones and because they have the headsets, they contract with a set of preferred uh, interpreters that they're used to working. And they have all the power to determine what price they're going to pay. And it's, it's a lot uh, uh, demand driven. But if you go to another situation like the court systems where uh, different courts have different buyer behaviors, and there is a demand for my favorite example, as I mentioned before, Latvian to Swahili. Uh, and there is one guy in the world that can do that stuff. This guy can charge whatever he wants. So the 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 supply is scarce, the demand is high. The, they they can charge whatever they want, but what is driving pre price? And this is one of the conversations that uh, uh, always comes into play. It's actually the public sector. The biggest buyer of interpretation services in the world today are government entities in the different uh, major geographies, and they are driving down prices. Yeah. Yeah, you pointed that out in the index as well, where, if, for example, in the UK, there was a very big contro controversy uh, a few years ago when Capita actually received that framework contract for all the court work, and then they lost it to the big word, and that's what made the big word the biggest UK language provider. I thought that was really astounding, and I remember how big of an issue it was back then, because Capita basically single-handedly, yeah, I mean, it still is an issue, because Capita basically single-handedly destroyed the entire court interpreting market for anyone who wanted to make a, a living doing that so i think that was a really interesting situation and that just shows uh, exactly what you said like they set a lot of the price benchmarks and it's very difficult for people then to say well i'm not working for this price when the client says well but this is what's being paid in the public sector do, do you know the story how how capita got into that contract do you know the background of how that happened and how sleazy that is and what a, do, do i want to know yeah what an important I've heard, yeah i've is, uh, I've heard there, but S stories, it, the, the short story is that this guy from uh, uh, oh, I forgot the name of the company, AL ALS, ALS, ALS. Yeah. Uh, he essentially sold the contract for a very low price, 
And then he went to Capital, which is a company that specializes in providing services for the UK government. They don't do, they didn't do only interpretation. They do uh, vendor management. They do jail repairs. They do a bunch of services for the UK government. And he went to them and sold the contract. Say, hey, I just want this 40 million pound contract. Uh, do you want to buy? And then the guy says, okay, we'll pay you, I don't know, 20 million dollars, 20 million pounds for for the company, and, they, and and I says, great, that's a great price. I have the contract; it's signed. Uh, it starts in three months, and Capita gave him six million pounds in advance and said that he would get the rest uh, during the performance of the contract. And he said, "Well, I'm happy with six million dollars," and he walks away. So, oh my God, uh, uh, Capita was stuck <laughs> with this uh, contract that was impossible to 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 deliver. But it, it, they had a contractual obligation. So the, the the beauty, what we as language professionals have to uh, 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 learn from this situation is that there is a threshold of low price. There is a, 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 an amount where uh, interpreters will say, uh, I, 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 I had enough, I'm not taking this anymore like that <laughs> uh, network movie. And I think that's what a lot of colleagues yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. Which is what happened. About. That's exactly yeah. what happened, isn't it? That they're, doing, they're going through the same thing in Denmark now. Yeah. Right? Mm. yeah. Uh, but this is the lesson learned. I think this is the thing that was that I had uh, kind of almost a front seat on that because I was on the ITI board during the previous changeover and I also heard about the kind of first contract going out and I think the interesting point is you've got the big government buyers who are driving kind of the, the big companies and I love to on your index you talked about how the conference interpreting companies tend to be smaller because the individual contract value is a lot smaller than a government contract the other trend that I'm seeing in the UK and this is fairly new I've only spotted it the past couple of years is the growing trend for interpreters to think, well, if if agencies can win those contracts, you know, if, if it's a £5,000 contract or a £6,000 contract, if agencies can win them, why can't we? And, mm-hmm. you know, the first event that I went to to try and win new direct clients, um, chatting to someone on a stand, it was about three or four years ago, and they said, oh, we hire interpreters all, all the time, but I've never actually met one. The last one I was at... I went to a stand and they were getting fed up at the number of interpreters talking to them. And I thought this is this is a shift where people are going, actually, you know, we yes, we'll quite happily work with sound suppliers, yes, we'll quite happily work with, you know, conference organizers or whatever, but there does seem to be an increasing thing here in the UK where interpreters are going, actually, we can look at what the clients are wanting for the next job and and we can do that ourselves because we tend to know I don't know about in Germany but here in the UK we know who the good technology suppliers are we know who the good uh, we, we know which venues are going to be helpful and which aren't and we can say to the clients look if you haven't got your sound supplier in we already know a good one we work with them all the time and that kind mm. of not taking the job of an agency but certainly being able to to interface straight with the client and understand straight from them what's going on and what they're after, it feels like a game changer in the UK, even if it's becoming a slow burner because of a certain B word, which I'm not going to mention. Um, but that is a trend that I think interpreters are beginning to turn around and say, we don't have to wait for the jobs to come to us. We can go find them. But I mean, can we provide the volume? That's the thing, right? Because the reason that people go for agency is is because it's easier. No, isn't that this volume? We we have we have here at uh, globally speaking, we have interviewed several language entrepreneurs, and uh, uh, my business partner Tucker Johnson and I have written a book on this topic, uh, the general theory of the translation company, is that most, if not all. Translation companies start with a translator that has an entrepreneurial vein. So all it needs, all you need to have is the first client. And, and the, the, the nature of the language business is a business that is based on subcontracting. You get the client, you hire the translators, the interpreters, the resources that you need. You have a project management infrastructure. What clients are really buying is project management, vendor management. Yeah. And scheduling and peace of mind, of, uh, <laughs> uh, peace of mind, and and their bosses off their necks. 
Yeah, uh, in, <laughs> totally. In, 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 the, in, the, in the interpreting business, the scheduling is a key element also. Yes. And that's the survival. Absolutely true. But I think Jonathan is kind of, and Alex, even what you were saying, if, whether or not we can provide the volume, I think we can. And I think a lot of the times in Germany, we do. Um, and it's funny, Jonathan, how you were saying that in the UK, this is kind of a monumental shift that is that is currently occurring, because as far as I can remember, pretty much as soon as I came back over here to Germany, is kind of just a given, like people just like, that's just how it works. Like you go and find your clients either through word of mouth or you actually go out and actively look for companies working in the expert sector, working in this sector or that sector where you believe this could be a viable client and then you approach them. And I mean, the thing is not everybody wants to do it. Not everybody is necessarily good at doing it, but there are, I don't know, I'm just going to throw out a number, like a hundred excellent um, consultant interpreters in Germany that do exactly the job that an agency would do. But the benefit that we always have, and I've sold this to clients many times, and you'd be really surprised at how how well this goes over, is that when you book through us, when you book through me, I actually can tell you who I'm going to send you. Or if you actually book me, I'm not just a random interpreter. Like you actually talk to me and then you know this is what you get. Or I can tell you who you're going to get and that's going to be the person. So you also sell like the targeted know-how and you sell... What's the opposite of anonymity? You sell familiarity. Like they know what they get. But the, the thing is, you you don't do this for you don't do this for a big medical company. You don't do this for a big hospital. You don't do this for courts. You don't do this for police. And if you think of the policemen, you know that they're, they're bringing something in in the middle of the night. They need an interpreter. They don't want to. They don't want to go through all the list of the accredited interpreters. They want to call one number and then they want the interpreter to show up ten minutes later. Right, but that's a different thing, right? Because that's know, the public but, sector again. Yeah. I'm talking about the like the. But it's interpreting you know, like too. The, that's what I'm saying. Automo- yeah, yeah, that's true. But like I'm talking about like the automotive companies or like I don't know yeah. the entertainment sector, like that kind of stuff. Mm. That's not what happens in the middle of the night where you have an emergency and you need somebody ASAP. That's where you plan an event, and then you have somebody show up. Of course, but, in your what, what you're describing, you're acting as a, as a business. So you're, you're just a small agency, and and that yes. and, yeah. and and that's another thing that we Fully. I've been saying and we repeatedly over the years is that what what customers buy is customer service. There, there are two things that haven't changed in. Uh, forever in the language business, you have you, we have changed technology, we have thing, changed processes, we have changed the rates. A lot of stuff has changed, but the only two things that have not changed is that you convert content from one language to the other, and you deliver customers. If you service. put it like customers that, customers <laughs> come back to you <laughs> yeah. because you have the phone. They come back to you because you understand their business, because you're good looking, because it's all. Uh, um, personal reasons more than business reasons. And, and the difference between uh, 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 2,000 euro and 1,800 euro is not going to make them switch vendors if they're happy with the, 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 the level of service that you're providing, right? That's right. I couldn't agree more. I would definitely agree. And I would say I've been surprised at how... You, there's there's two kinds of client that I've noticed that come around. You get the client that really just want it to be right and the clients who want it to be right. And it doesn't matter where you meet them or what end of the buying decision they're at. The clients who want it to be right really care about, you know, um, I was talking to one client and they said, your USP is that as long as people are available, you can send me the same team every time. And I said, well, I would default to sending you the same team every time because I would always want to pick who's the best person for this job. You know, I know like, six German to English interpreters and I know what their strengths and weaknesses are because I've worked with them um, and everyone knows that interpreter that you would say you know this is an AGM fine they're fantastic at that but I wouldn't send them to a sales meeting or to a press event we we know what our colleagues are good at um, and you get that kind of client are great to work with and are fabulous and I love it when you get you know can you tell me how much this will cost and you know the price isn't really the thing but you get the other clients who you know from the get-go, the clients who send you in the first email, can I get a quote tomorrow? You know they're doing, the boss wants three quotes from three suppliers. You know exactly where the job's going to go. And it is almost, I was chatting to one um, interpreting technology vendor who said that his, 
his company has changed policy that they just don't bid for those work anymore. And one of the questions that they ask is, are you in contact with any other potential suppliers? And I thought that's actually a really good question to ask up front to say, you know, what, what's the what's the buying decision based on? Is it based on you want high quality, you want the best, or is it based on boss says I need to get this as cheap as possible? Uh, that's that's the concept of uh, customer maturity, right? And, and, and the best kinds are the ones that have been burnt before <laughs> because they know what a cheap interpreter means. Mm, they, yeah, know they know what embarrassment that can cause. They know that uh, uh, it's not the price that is going to make a difference. It's actually the qualification, the experience, the knowledge, the engagement, and a lot of other variables. And one of the variables that you mentioned is actually industry expertise. And I know that you interpreters are, and and I really don't envy interpreters because I have very good friends who are interpreters and they spend hours and hours and days mm. preparing and studying. The client is buying six hours of interpretation, but in reality, they are paying for 20, 30 hours of study and preparation. However, um, uh, you still don't want uh, an interpreter who specializes in accounting to be working on a medical conference <laughs> or a, a medical interpreter or, or, or doing Formula One championships because they don't really... No, anything about it. It depends what happens, <laughs> you, happens during the Grand Prix. <laughs> but I mean, Very it, good point. It's, it's a, it seems <laughs> to be a really true. tricky situation. But I mean, if if I can throw you a curveball question, Renato, because we talked about the the terrible situation in the UK. But what what's what's sort of the way out there? I mean, what's what would your you, you probably don't want to give free advice to anyone, but if you had to, you know. No, no, no. What's the, the way out? The, the, I think that the the market and, and this is it's. Um, it's horrible to say when, when, when you're talking to individuals, it's very different to talk about market. And uh, I know that there are some uh, very respectable people in the language services industry that have these ideas about the uh, uh, high-end market. And then there is a difference. There is a, a, a low price market, like where all the scavengers are, and there is this high-end market everybody should strive for. But the reality is that the key word is the market. Uh, the market is, is you can't manipulate supply and demand. You can't manipulate uh, availability and scarcity. You can't. These are market realities. And you cannot determine that it's illegal to charge less than the official price for interpretation. Because you know what? That uh, guy who lost his wife and has three kids at home and he needs to bring uh, milk to the table at night and there is a job that is going to offer him 25% less than the uh, approved price by the association, he's going to take the job and he's going to do a great job because he's in the market and there is a demand for him at that price point and he's available and the client was able to reach him. Um, you cannot control all the variables. So, uh, and one of the things that I that I see is this attempt to to to, and I admire it. And I admired what happened with the capital situation, where, but it wasn't the ITI, it wasn't the associations, it wasn't anybody that started this process of interpreters. The interpreters organized themselves on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on social media, and they started rejecting the requests, right? So the quality started to go down. They had inquiries in the uh, uh, parliament, and uh, the, the, the contract expired, and uh, the lesson was learned, and the Ministry of Justice went and got bids for higher prices. And... The, the 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 market seeks equilibrium always, right? It's it's an it might take some time, and uh, my my business partner at Common Sense Advisor used to say, um, um, if you ask a pig if uh, he is a commodity, he's going to say no. I'm a pig. I have a heart, and uh, but if you go to the Chicago Board of Trade and you look at the 
uh, it's going to say seven pounds a, pe- a, a pork belly, <laughs> right? And that's a commodity. And we are people with a heart. We we have families. We have studied. We have invested in our development. We're not a commodity. Yeah, but when it comes to buying, uh, you see, one of the things about telephone interpreting that I learned studying the interpretation market is that uh, large companies like Language Line, Syracom, and, and companies like that, they negotiate millions of minutes with the client. So they will sign a contract where the price for the first 10 million minutes is going to be X, and for the next uh, 5 million minutes is going to be X minus 10%, and for the next 5 million minutes is X minus 15%, and so on and so forth. So here we are talking about hourly rates and how we're going to get 200 hours worth of interpretation in a month. And these guys are negotiating 20 million minutes a year, 200 million minutes a year. So uh, uh, scale affects all of those discussions. And what you're doing, Alex, when you describe that I can build a team of really nice people to deliver excellent quality to my customer, uh, you're doing vendor management. And uh, instead of charging uh, 100% markup, instead of doubling the price of your colleague that is going to work on it, you're charging him an administ- you're not charging him, you're charging your client an administration fee that is going to be five to 20 percent of that deal. Uh, it, it's still a markup, but it's much lower than a, a translation company would do. So different dynamics. Which I also get because, you know, obviously I have like, I have less staff, I have less stuff, I have less overhead basically to take care of. So it all makes sense to me. And I'm not saying that all translation agencies are bad because they can, if it's a good one, if it's a good translation agency, company, office, LSP, whatever you want to call them, they can take a lot of work and hassle off of your hands, right? So that can be very helpful indeed. It's just oftentimes it feels like they're happy to take the money, but then still have you do all the work. I remember when I was in the UK, that oftentimes is exactly what it felt like. They the they would pay you. Yeah, the agencies. Okay. Like they would happily take the cut from your fee, but then you would still have to like chase the client, chase the agency. And, yeah. So yeah, right. ask for documents. So the whole... The whole so end- you're, you're, you're having the conversation about the pig, right? You are the pig. <laughs> and that's the problem. <laughs> you're, you're the- Exactly. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. You as yeah, a yeah. pork belly, as a I know two pounds of bacon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that's the problem that we, <laughs> we as professionals, we have pride. We have, of course, uh, yeah, uh, this aspiration of doing a great job and making a difference and 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 changing the course of things. Uh, and it's commendable. It's beautiful. And when I am acting as a professional translator i have those feelings but at the others on the other side i'm an economist i understand business i negotiate contracts i look at this very pragmatically and dispassionately is how much profit am i going to extract from this how much money can i squeeze from you to to lower my cost how much money can i uh, get from the client. How much more money can I get to, to the client so that I can I can make more profit? So that's the rule of the game. And uh, if we are dispassionate about it, we will have a much better life and uh, we will stress a lot less. But there is a limit, right? There is a price threshold that if you go below that, um, and and these are two lines that that will meet. Automated translation will give you. Uh, uh, automated interpretation will give you a product at a very low cost and uh, uh, professional translation uh, or or even for free like Skype and professional translation, the lowest that it will get will be too expensive still for that person that cannot afford it. So the, the good client is the one that is going to make the trade-off. Do I want to, can I survive with machine interpretation? Will I not look ridiculous? Let's say that I'm selling Porsches and Mercedes. I don't want to associate my my brand with something something so low class. I want to have an interpreter that wears a tuxedo and has a big mustache and looks like a 
a wine November yet. But I think that's that's what bothers me so much about this because uh, some administrations in in some countries have decided that they'll go for the lowest price, and and then that usually leads to low quality interpreting. And uh, I just think it's not fair because then um, uh, a, a medical procedure, treatment in hospital, or a, or a trial. I mean, that really matters. And if in such a situation you just get sort of the, the cheapest available interpreter or, yeah. I don't know, machine interpreting at some point, that seems unfair. And and the private company can hire Alex and his great team <laughs> and they do, you know, outstanding interpreting. It's I mean, sure. I, 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 I have to be careful what I say here because it is not under full release. But I was recently part of a research team and we were researching, interpreting in in those wider settings. I have to be so careful that I don't get in trouble here. But it's a myth that governments will necessarily always go for the lowest suppliers because in some of these cases, not all of them, the, the, the people at the sharp end, or at least the people who are managing the people at the sharp end, have a say in how services are procured. And I think one of the myths that we've had in interpreting, and I didn't realize it was a myth until very, very recently, was that we have this myth that all the decisions for like the UK government are take place in Whitehall, where the, the civil service and the parliament are, and nothing's done locally. And so all of our work with individual doctors' practices or individual this is going to fall by the wayside. That's Depending on how things are set up, that's not true. And there's some work to be done. I love. I think it was you and Michael and Renato said at the start about the importance of adding value. I think there is a way through where if we can build a relationship with people who are in procurement to any level, uh, there's various levels of independence in different organisations. If we can be brave enough to build a relationship with the procurement people, understanding the pressures on them, that they're being asked to do the impossible. They're being asked to square the circle of they want a cheap service, but they want perfect quality. Everyone knows that it's impossible. The procurement people know that's impossible. I'm sure the people giving them the money secretly know that is impossible. But if we understand those pressures, then actually we can have a much more interesting conversation. And I know there have been conversations in other sectors where consultant interpreters have said to clients okay you have you know four things that you're doing let's look at where the the best places to deploy high quality interpreting is you know an AGM that's the same AGM that they've had for the past 12 years and they all really speak the same language but they're calling interpreters anyway maybe there's a case for saying to the client well if you've got a portfolio of five events in the next year let's look at where we deploy remote where we deploy machine interpreting where we deploy human interpreters and as we practice getting good at that we can have a similar conversation with the big public service buyers and we can work with them rather than seeing them as the enemy and going oh no they're trying to cut costs say okay you're trying to cut costs let's find a safe way to cut costs and that's a much more mature conversation than going ah how dare you cut costs of course they're cutting costs because people don't want the taxes going up well, yeah but but uh, uh, an important role that we as an industry play i was just recently at the atc conference in london the association of translation companies in the uk and they invited procurement people from the, the how do they call it, the crown, uh, crown services or something like that. And they are government procurement people. They invited these people to participate in roundtables to discuss and so on. And I had the opportunity to speak to two of them. And the feedback that, they, that I received from them was essentially, I had no idea. I didn't know the level of, of professional, professionalism. I didn't know uh, all the things that are involved in uh, delivering high quality service and the procurement and the project management and the vendor management and the qualifications, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So once they see the complexity of what it is, because they think it's just buying toilet paper or uh, uh, um, cloud services or something like that, that is quite... Uh, uh, unit based and it's not talent based so the more we can as an industry educate buyers that what they're buying is talent is years of study education training uh, 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 practice 
and uh, they will understand. I mean, nobody has, and nobody, of course, they negotiate, but it's not the same thing with surgeons. It's not the same thing with engineers. It's not the same thing with uh, uh, plumbers. Sometimes I know that in the United States, it's uh, uh, easier to buy translation than it is to buy plumbing, and you would say, well, uh, but it, it is it is true, and, and a plumber makes a lot more money than a translator because he needs to be certified yes. and he needs to be. Uh, and because supply and demand, exactly, like it's the same thing in Munich. Like plumbers make a ton of money because everybody's looking for them, and there's like five in the whole city, so they can so they can charge whatever they want. Yeah, so it's the same thing though. And everybody needs a plumber at some point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and yet. How many? How many are the in, uh, German English interpreters there are? <laughs> yeah. But there are. The, you, it's right what you said earlier, Renato. Is there are only a handful, really, really, really good ones. So um, it depends on what kind of quality you're looking for. And those those are busy. Pretty right? sure yeah. those have their schedules. Because they do media and yeah. And, uh, mm. Those are. And, and and there's another element. It, it it doesn't help for you to be good and to be hiding at home. Right? I like that. Uh, you need to be good, but you, th there is this one, one of the things, and it's a presentation that I've been doing this year that I, I call the future of work. There are three things that every professional needs to have if they want not to be replaced by technology. They need to be findable. They need to be relevant in what they do. And they need to be knowledgeable about uh what is going on they need to be current about what is going on in the market right so it doesn't help if you want to go into the market and be you are the most knowledgeable uh, person in volcanology from german into korean i don't know if there are that's a very niche topic korea, yeah. <laughs> but uh, in japan <laughs> you might be the best translator and there is the demand of one million words per year for that kind of thing, but you work with typewriters. You're not going to be able to process it. You need to be current. Yeah. Be aware of what is going on in your market and what are the things that allow you to provide your service. Because every hour that you don't work, every hour that you are uh, sitting at home and, and, and not doing interpretation is a sunk cost. It's an opportunity loss. Right. So if you have a good mix, and I like this concept of the over the phone interpreter that can just check in and check out. So I have, uh, it's raining. I have done four days of uh, uh, conference interpreting. I'm going to be home for the next three days. I have no engagements. I have nothing to do. I check in into Language Line, Syracom, uh, Global, one of these players. And um, if there is a, an interpretation demand, my phone is going to ring and I start interpreting. I don't know what, but uh, I will make a tenth of uh, what I would make in a cabin, but uh, it's better than zero because the cost of not doing anything is, is zero. I mean, the cost is the same. The, the price of, of doing nothing is zero. But anything that you get that is above zero is, is a benefit. That's right. But I think it's, you know, for people working in the private economy, I think it's important what guys like you do at NIMSI, but also what happens at Slater.com, just to kind of put that business spin on interpretation. Because I think oftentimes, as Jonathan was saying earlier, a lot sometimes people don't see themselves as that business, not necessarily, um, you know, any anyone present. But I think it's important that we have to kind of see ourselves as a business. And, you know, I sometimes make this analogy with, with some clients like, yes, you can buy an iPhone for a thousand euro and yes, it's expensive, but it's also going to be an excellent phone. You can also get a phone for a hundred euro. You can also call someone, but it's not going to be, I know Alex, I should, I should have come up with like, no, a, no, no, you no. can buy, you can buy a Porsche, you can buy a Porsche or you can buy, I don't know, like a beetle or something, you know, like the, yeah. You can buy champagne and you can buy sect. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like every everything, you know, like it, it functionally everyone, yeah. has, yeah, functionally it's it does the same thing, but it's how it does it mm. and what you want. And for some people, the sect is fine. Some people want the champagne. So I think for us as businesses, and that's why I think it's important to have these conversations and to have 
more of a business focus on on the the industry as a whole we have to kind of take that same approach. I mean, if I want an iPhone, but I go into the Apple store and say, I'm going to give you 500 euro for your iPhone, they're going to kick me out. And I think we sometimes have to do the same thing. And you just have to say, sorry, this is the price that I have. If you're not willing to pay my price, Absolutely. then I'm just going to turn around and, and you know, do something else. Like I would rather have a day, uh, a spa day <laughs> than work my ass off for like 400 euro if it's going to be a super mm-hmm. difficult conference. And that's just the thing that that we sometimes have to, and I feel like oftentimes, especially as freelancers, you struggle with that because you're like, oh, yeah, but it's a new client or it's this or it's that. Mm. But then if that's the business, you wouldn't go to a to a lawyer and say, how much are you charging? Oh, it's 400 euros an hour. I'll give you 20. <laughs> I, th- I think one of the interesting things, and this is kind of circling back to the, the topic of books and writing, because I know you've, you've written a book, Renato, is that in both of the books I've written, but especially the second one, which comes out before Christmas in all good bookstores, um, especially in the second one, I came to this topic of industry PR. And I, I realized that historically, the interpreting industry PR has been, what's the nice word for it? Garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Be, because we haven't, precisely as you said, we haven't, we either haven't been findable We've expected clients to come to our websites and, you know, why do clients not know about the IEC list? Doesn't everyone know about the IEC list? Or we've expected client the clients will know the right routes to find us. And we've also expected the clients will understand what it is we do. And I recently had a, last year I was doing a presentation at a business networking event and the business coach that I'd been, that I'd known for about six months came up to me and I, I kid you not, at the end of my talk said, Wow, I didn't realize that interpreting was so interesting and so hard. Well, and and uh, it's amazing that some people know that interpreting is different from translation because in reality it isn't, but it's our professional distinction. In reality, it's all translation in the mind of the client. They see an interpretation job and they say, "Oh, let me talk to the, the translator." Right, but in our niche language, it's the same thing. It's probably if I if I look at a uh, if I talk to a chemist about his realm, and I will say that well, this is a solution. The guy says, well, "This is not solution. This is a, I don't know chemistry, but this is something completely different than a solution. And it's it's a, it's it's this is not a salt. It's a crystal. I I don't know because I don't know the lingo." And, and it's the same thing. We make ourselves very important and we separate and we joke about translators and interpreters and, and difference and so on. But in the mind of the uh, layman, all we do is convert content from one language to another. Some people do it in writing. Some, te- some people, people do it in speaking. Some people do it uh, in sign language. Uh, some people do it through machines. And uh, one of the things that I find fascinating is now these uh, um, video conferencing platforms. In my company, we use Google Hangouts. You can turn on subtitling. So it, it does voice recognition and automatic subtitling. And the quality is pretty good. So I can record that and I can, if if I'm deaf, if I can... Uh, uh, follow the conversation without, if I don't have headsets, uh, I can get a pretty good sense of what is going on in the conversation. And we wouldn't think about it a few years ago. So what I think, what I believe, and I think that we can try to wrap this in in, in a way that uh, I, I, I think that the future is bright for interpretation. This is going to be a skill that is going to increase in demand. The, the market as a whole is uh, 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 rising, it's growing. Uh, you might have these pockets of dissatisfaction. Um, uh, the key, the, the main languages that have the most demand naturally will have uh, price pressure and so on. But if you look at the industry as a whole, uh, the, the, there will be more opportunities for interpretation to be used. Uh, we're recording this uh, podcast on Zoom. Zoom uh, has announced that uh, it, it will have uh, simultaneous interpretation available in the platform. I don't even know. I haven't used Zoom in a couple of months. Maybe they already have it. Um, uh, interpretation is, is, 
It's, it's not going to be something unique. It's going to be a feature. It's like a spell checker, right? It's going to be part of every conferencing environment. Uh, in the beginning of, of, of word processing, you paid a lot of money for mm. uh, a spell checker, yeah. uh, a grammar checker then. And today, I mean, you can use Grammarly on, on, on Google and it's free and it gives you advice on how to write your, your, your content better. So we're going, you can count on the fact that uh, things are going to change. I believe that the, there are benefits in which uh, um, it's going to be cheaper, it's going to be faster, cheaper to deliver, not necessarily to uh, provide the service. Another thing that we haven't talked about, and I think it's going to be the theme of uh, 2020, everybody's going to talk about it at nauseam, is going to be 5G and how 5G is going to completely revolutionize communication and how it's going to completely change the way that we talk. Uh, our headsets are going to be super connected with, uh, we, we, now we talk about Bluetooth, but uh, this conversation of the internet of things is going to be completely, completely changed. And in 2025, we're going to look back at uh, what we're doing today, and we're going to think that these were the Middle Ages. Uh, the, the, the kind of, of, of transformation that is going to happen in the next few years is going to be uh, uh, overwhelming because of, of, of 5G. We all tend to think of 5G as the, the next uh, advance in speed to our cell phones. But 5G is actually a, a, an exponential. It's a, it's a logarithmic improvement in the connectivity around the world. So uh, be prepared. Uh, all these conversations that are having are going to sound like jokes <laughs> in a few years. Yeah. Listen to me. You heard it here. You first. heard it here before. So we're gonna we're gonna have to do a follow up <laughs> episode then. But I think Renata, that was a, a very good wrap up, <laughs> at least for tonight, because I actually have loads of topics that I was going to get into, but we, we don't have enough time, unfortunately. For example, on your on your last um, episode of Globally Speaking, you you were talking about um, transcription and how interpreters are actually very good. Uh, or would would be very good um, as well for uh, providing transcription services. So maybe we can get into that in, in another episode or in a, in a future discussion, sort of different things that interpreters can provide. Absolutely. Uh, this is so much fun. I, I'm so happy that we have a chance to have this cross uh, uh, conversation because uh, our worlds overlap and podcasting is such a fun thing. Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it, it was actually Michael's idea, and yeah, yeah. Uh, we we I I I'm a, an avid podcast listener, but uh, uh, I had always thought of doing one. But if it weren't for Michael, we wouldn't have started it. He was the one who put it into action, which is great.